Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Randomly Rack and I hope you're doing well. Uh, this weekend I read Nella Larson's Passing, an extraordinary novel from 1929. So from the latter part of the Harlem Renaissance and really one of the crown jewels of the Harlem Renaissance, an absolutely fantastic novel. You know, it's short. Uh, in this edition it's about 115 pages like within the text uh, with some notes and introduction, but it could probably be in a, like a different print, maybe 150 pages. It's a shorter novel. But what Larson accomplishes in this book is so much more than what so many four to five hundred page novels are like aspiring to. Um, it, it's such a, a passionate, interesting, like deeply conscious book. And it, 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 there's an, an, an element to it where it's sort of like a river, where it, it, the narrative flows at all times. It just keeps moving. There's not a useless word in the book. Um, but there are these periods of like deep expansion, you know, the current slows so that we're, we're in Irene Redfield's consciousness. So we're with her, we're, we're in this reflection, we're finding memories encapsulated within memories, kind of, a, you know, th that, that uh, trait of modernist literature. And we're, we're able to sort of just drift and focus on all these interesting details. And then we hit the rapids. And just like in the, as a human mind just jumps, we're in periods of passion and fe fear and fury and you know deep confusion and it's just moving quickly and we're not paying attention to all the details with Irene Redfield we're fixating on specific details and sprinting off to another one and it's so it's, it's just astonishing um, what what's happening in this book so I want to read uh, a paragraph that, that sort of gives a sense of what Larson's capable of and then talk about some ideas from the book read one other uh, passage that sort of shows <laughs> where there's a bend in the river if you will <laughs> to stick with the metaphor and then just identify a couple of other books that uh, you, you might enjoy if you've read Passing or, you know, if you've read these, you might really enjoy Passing. So this is how chapter two of the book starts. This is what Irene Redfield remembered. Chicago, August, a brilliant day, hot, with a brutal staring sun pouring down rays that were like molten rain, a day on which the very outlines of the buildings shuddered as if in protest at the heat. Quivering lines sprang up from baked pavements and wiggled along the shining car tracks. The automobiles parked at the curbs were a dancing blaze and the glass of the shop windows threw out a blinding radiance. Sharp particles of dust rose from the burning sidewalks, stinging the seared or dripping skins of wilting pedestrians. What small breeze there was seemed like the breath of a flame fanned by slow bellows. Whoa! So that first sentence is what Irene Redfield remembered. It's just like the first paragraph of that chapter. And then the rest of that is the second paragraph, which is a paragraph written in lightning. I mean, that's the, the images that are captured there, the deep sense of just, you know, everybody's sweating, everybody's sweltering. We're in hell. And we come to realize that the characters who are, who, who are you know, passing in this book are, in a sense, you know, either passing because they feel that their previous life was hell or they recognize that they're sort of like walled off and that anything outside that, you know, that those walls will be hell. And it just, it just creates this sense of oppression and fear uh, in, you know, five lines. And then we're off into the narrative. So what is passing? Well, what does that mean? Uh, I'm a teacher. We're not passing classes. That's not what it refers to. Um, it's, a, it's a concept pushed in... Uh, James Walden Johnson wrote this in like 1912, autobiography of an ex-colored man. It's this concept that with the end of the, of the United States Civil War and the, you know, the abolition of slavery, but then Reconstruction ending eight years later, uh, seven years later, um, 12 years later, yeah, 12 years later, uh, the, um, the Jim Crow South rises, primarily in the southern United States, but you know, those, those different, you know, uh, uh, segregation laws, um, laws against interracial marriage, those existed outside of the Southern United States. They existed in the North, they existed in the Midwest, they existed in the Southwest. Um, in fact, even, you know, between 1877, when we have the end of Reconstruction, and the Voting Rights Acts and, and Civil Rights Acts in the 1950s and 1960s, even after that had happened, there were still states that outlawed interracial marriage after the Civil Rights Act. Um, that wasn't struck down in, until later. So uh, w within passing, what's, what that refers to is this idea that um, individuals who had 
you know, black ancestors and then ancestors, usually ancestors who were white, but uh, it could have been, you know, another like another race um, who didn't appear to have as many like phenotype features uh, that were associated with, with Africans or with African Americans. So whether it's hair or skin color, var various things, um, they would, they could pass and, and, um, and, and live as white people and be able to like go into restaurants or movie theaters or public pools, um, without, you know, having to experience the same segregation, but there's a deep level of fear. And so we have Irene Redfield who at the very beginning, uh, you know, even though we know, we find out that she is married to a, a, a black man who's a doctor, a successful doctor in Harlem, when she's in Chicago, she uh, is able to go into the Drayton Hotel, which is a, the Drake Hotel in Chicago. Fabulous place, by the way. My wife and I stayed there on our anniversary one time, and it really is ex exceedingly elegant and nice. Um, she goes into the tea room at the Drake Hotel without having to be thrown out. Uh, but that, that's sort of the only way in which she, and she's very self-conscious about that. That's sort of the only way in which she passes is to like not have to deal with, you know, racism in every aspect of society, uh, when she's on her own. But she encounters an old friend whose entire adult life has been spent, uh, passing. And so this friend of hers, Claire, is married to a white man who thinks she's white, who, and her husband is like openly racist, uses the N-word refers to black devils I and mean, he's a, he's an reprehensible and evil man uh, and she's married to this guy and is living you know as you know as a white person because he and he he taught they, there are jokes because he doesn't realize it so there's some like ironic joking about you know well would you ever have you know a black person around me oh no no you know and he's just going off and so it seems that that's what the book is about is this tension uh, and, and like the deep, deep fear that Claire could, Claire should have if her husband were to ever find out, um, and that Irene has for Claire. But we come to realize, like, as I said, there's a bend in the river, and we come to realize that Irene's life experiences other levels of, you know, of pressure and, and fear um, that don't strictly stem from the fact that she's black and that she's worried about racism. And so her relationship with her husband I think in, to a certain degree mirrors Larson's own relationship to a sort of uh, a, a fairly renowned um, uh, professor at Fisk University, a notable HBCU. And so this is a conversation they have. I do wish, Irene, you wouldn't be forever fretting about those kids. They're all right, perfectly all right. Good, strong, healthy boys, especially Junior. Most especially Junior. Well, I suppose you're right. You're expected to know about things like that, and I'm sure you wouldn't make a mistake about your own boy. Now, why had she said that? But that isn't all. I'm terribly afraid he's picked up some queer ideas about things, some things from the older boys, you know. Her manner was consciously light. Apparently, she was intent of the maze of traffic, but she was still watching Brian's face closely. On it was a peculiar expression. Was it, could it possibly be, a mixture of scorn and distaste? Queer ideas, he repeated. Do you mean ideas about sex, Irene? Yes, not quite nice ones. Dreadful jokes and things like that. Oh, I see, he threw at her. For a while, there was silence between them. After a moment, he demanded bluntly, Well, what of it? If sex isn't a joke, what is it? And what is a joke? As you please, Brian. He's your son, you know. Her voice was clear, level, disapproving. Exactly. And you're trying to make a molly coddle out of him. Well, let me just tell you, I won't have it. And you needn't think I'm going to let you change him to some nice kindergarten kind of a school because he's getting a little necessary education. I won't. He'll stay right where he is. The sooner and the more he learns about sex, the better for him. And most certainly if he learns that it's a grand joke, the greatest in the world, it'll keep him from lots of disappointments later on. That's how he's speaking to his wife. And so as much as this is a book about, you know, what, 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 what could life be like um, living as a black person in 1929 in the United States, it is just as much about what is it like to live as a woman in 1929 in the United States. Um, and Larson shows that there are so many uh, different aspects of human identity that are critical, that there are so many ways in which, you know, a relationship between two individuals can be healthy or can be uh, a dis destructive and tearing down. 
And she does it in a way where she's never acting as a narrator outside of Irene Redfield. So we're with Irene Redfield. We're seeing um, sort of antecedents to her to her thoughts and to the choices she makes and the behavior she makes. Um, and then we see the consequences of that. But but the whole time we're we're with her, we're in her mind, and it's just such a such a, a moving book to experience, and to really get in and and be. Uh, trying to perceive and, and sympathize or empathize with uh, with her existence and, and what she sees on a daily basis. Um, as I mentioned, it really does move as a narrative. It moves very quickly, uh, but there's so it, it packs so much and it's very dense. There's so much to pay attention to. Uh, it's it's filled with some interesting little colloquialisms that have remained today. Um, different little things. It's, I, I always think it's funny to see what is like footnoted. But there are some of the some of the uh, uh, end notes were just little bits of slang that still exist. Um, you know that I've heard like my wife use, or I've heard my mother-in-law use, or, or just different people use. Uh, and so there there were aspects of it that were were a real delight. But then again, there were aspects of it that were absolutely a you know Greek tragedy from the Harlem Renaissance. And there's a couple of like weird connections I found within this book. So there's like the obvious connections like. As I said, James Weldon Johnson's autobiography of a colored man, ex-colored man, really pushes at that idea of of like what is race, what is um, you know what is racism constructed from, how can are are there ways people can sort of subvert some of those aspects of racism? Um, Charles W. Chestnut comes to mind. He was you know from an earlier generation, sort of a generation that uh, in a sense was repudiated by the Harlem Renaissance to a certain degree. Uh, he and W.B. Du Bois and some others. Um, but he pushed at a number of those same ideas uh, himself as, as a man who uh, had, you know, ancestors who were both black and ancestors who were white and sort of tried to um, be very, very engaged in, in civil rights movements and social equality. So Charles Chestnut comes to mind. Uh, but then there are, and, you know, obviously like the entire Harlem Renaissance comes to mind. But then there are like the really weird connections. I mentioned that there are aspects of like Greek tragedy where we kind of sense that there's this sense of dread of miasma um, that just hangs over the narrative. Uh, that that just, it, it's pervasive and it, it's set with that tone early on and then it just pervades the narrative. Um, but there are weirder connections. There's the modernist connections, the idea, um, Proust of course famously in Swan's Way has the moment where, you know, the Madeline sends him back on this rush of memories, the narrator Marcel. Well, within passing, the very first chapter is about Irene Redfield getting this letter from her friend Claire, and that elicits this whole memory back to an interaction they had at the Drayton Drake Hotel in Chicago, and then this whole this whole other memory of their childhood together. So it fills in these modernist ideas, and there's a real sense of, and it's not just because they're both written in the 20s, but what Larson is pushing at and sort of digging at with this idea of passing is not dissimilar as a theme from what Jay Gatsby is doing throughout The Great Gatsby, where he's pretending, you know, to be wealthy so that he can ascend to this, you know, money, to, you know, a money but untitled aristocracy in the United States. And he wants no one to know his past that, you know, he, he grew up poor. Uh, I will say, however, that both Irene Redfield, through her consciousness, and Claire, uh, the other main main female character, uh, both of them are so much more richly drawn, more fully drawn, more more fulfilling personalities and individuals than Daisy Buchanan. And then, of course, Claude McKay's fantastic uh, romance in Marseille, which takes place not even though it's it was written sort of during the Harlem Renaissance, right at the end. It wasn't published until this year by Penguin Classics. Uh, for the first time it was published. And uh, and it takes place mostly in Marseille and offers a really interesting counterpoint in, in a, it shows a world in which no one has to pass, in which, you know, uh, and, and no one has to pass in terms of their race, in terms of their sexual orientation. Uh, people are who they are and they, they live with as much joy as they possibly can, despite there being, you know, danger within their lives. And, uh, and so, just one of the best books I read this year, and so passing, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, I did, 
I'm doing the Reindeer Readathon, uh, hosted by Breakeven Books. I'm on Team Stalking. <laughs> and so one of the prompts was for Dasher, uh, the Reindeer Dasher. They're all, all the prompts are Reindeer. Uh, it was a novel with a one-word title. Well, passing fulfills that. Uh, plus, it fulfilled me. My stocking is filled, uh, you know, despite the tragedies within the book. And if you've never read the, uh, if you want an introduction to the Harlem Renaissance, the Viking Portable Harlem Renaissance Reader is a great introduction. So I don't know if you've read, ever read any of these, but if you have, let me know. You might wildly disagree with some of the thoughts I had on passing. Let me know those too. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks.